Hello and welcome back to that channel where some guy named Kamal solves these wacky looking integrals just for fun instead of, you know, hanging out with his friends like a normal person would because, well, he doesn't have any friends, but yeah, I I, ima I imagine that would be fun or something. Comment F to pay respects. Anyway, so I solve integrals and then you guys make time out of your busy schedules like 10, 15, 20 minutes and watch these solution developments. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Thank you for being here, by the way. I appreciate that. And today we have a very interesting structure. It's the integral i of s defined as the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the s minus 1 divided by 1 plus x plus x squared plus all the way up to x to the k minus 1 times the logarithm of x. And of course, you may wonder what exactly are the restrictions on the s parameter. Well, that will become apparent throughout the solution development as well as, of course, in the final result. I normally like doing that. I like to, keep, you know, keep the restrictions on the parameter as a surprise for the end. Not really a surprise. I prefer just to explore the solution development and then just, you know, cancel out cases that wouldn't work. Pathological cases for the parameter, as you may say, or forbidden cases. Whatever, enough fancy wording. We're trying to solve the integral. So, first up, notice that we have this pesky log x term in the denominator, but we have a perfect strategy for, get, for getting rid of that. We could just differentiate under the integral sign with respect to the parameter. So, taking the derivative with respect to s gives me the derivative of i with respect to s on the left-hand side. Now, I'm switching up the order of the operators, I have the integral from 0 to 1. of now the partial derivative with respect to s of x to the s minus 1 divided by 1 plus x plus x squared plus all the way up to x to the k minus 1 times this 1 by log x term as well, integration with respect to x. Wait a minute. And much better. Anyway, so what exactly is the derivative of i of uh, x with respect to s? So we're differentiating with respect to s while holding x constant. So the structure we would get would be x to the s times the logarithm of your constant base x. Okay, cool. So that means up top in the numerator, I have x to the s times the logarithm of x and the derivative of one is of course, well, zero. And that means the logarithms here are gonna cancel out quite nicely and we have i prime of s being equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the s divided by 1 plus x plus x squared plus all the way up to plus x to the k minus 1 dx. Now this really is a much nicer integral to work with because if I expand using 1 minus x, then notice in the denominator, this is basically the factorized version of x to the k minus 1, rather... 1 minus x to the k. Okay, cool. So this is what you have in the denominator, whereas in the numerator, we have something very simple to evaluate. It's x to the s minus x to the s plus 1. And this thing is being divided by 1 minus x to the k integration with respect to s. Now, let's make a u substitution first. We're going to let x to the k equal u. But this implies that x equals u to the 1 by k, and this further implies that dx equals 1 by k times u to the 1 by k minus 1 du. So this implies that i prime of s equals 1 by k times the integral. Well, the limits are still 0 to 1. The transformation did not affect them. Then we have x to the s, which would be u to the s by k minus u to the s by k plus 1, divided by 1 minus u times this term of u to the 1 by k minus 1, integration with respect to u now. Okay, cool. So we have 1 by k times the integral from 0 to 1 of what exactly we would have u to the s plus 1 by k minus 1, minus u to, mm -hmm. wait a minute, I think I messed up something. Yeah, this should be s plus 1 by k. Sorry, I don't know algebra. I just skipped straight to calculus. 
Anyway, so we have s plus 2 by k minus 1 divided by 1 minus u du. And what on earth are we supposed to do with this new integral? Well, we can solve this integral or express the integral anyway in terms of a special function and then play around with that special function until we get to a final result. So let me introduce you that let me introduce to you that special function. That is the digamma function. The digamma function psi of z is defined as the derivative with respect to z of log gamma z. So it's the logarithmic derivative of the gamma function. And it has a very nice infinite series. Uh, no, wait, it has a very nice integral representation that I'm going to use for this video. I have invoked the series representation many times. Anyway, so we have negative Euler Mascheroni constant plus integral 0 to 1, 1 minus u2. Wait, if this is going to be, yeah, this is z, then here should be a z minus 1 divided by 1 minus u du. So if I take the digamma function evaluated at z1 and subtract from it the digamma function evaluated at z2, then the Euler Mascheronis would just cancel out and I have the integral from 0 to 1 of u to the z2 minus 1, yeah, that that's it, minus u to the z1 minus 1 divided by 1 minus u du. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So that means the integral that we have can be expressed in terms of a difference of digamma functions. So this implies that I prime of s equals, uh -huh, so we have 1 by k times integral 0 to 1 let me just zoom out a bit so it's more visible. Okay, so that means, why am I writing 0 to 1 again? We just have digamma functions. So we have digamma. Uh, z2 over here would be s plus 2 by k minus digamma s plus 1 by k. So the whole objective of Feynman's trick is to evaluate the derivative of the integral function. And once we have that structure, that is, once we have i prime completely in terms of its parameter, in, in this case the s parameter, we plan to recover the integral function. And we can do that by integrating with respect to the parameter. So we know that the digamma function, digamma z, equals the logarithmic derivative of the gamma function. But wait a minute, doesn't that imply that the integral of digamma z dz equals log gamma z plus some constant of integration. Yes, it does. So this implies that on the left-hand side, we have i of s, and on the right, we have this factor of 1 by k times, what exactly? We have log gamma s plus 2 by k, and this would be divided by a factor of 1 by k, which amounts to just multiplying by k, okay, cool, minus the logarithm of gamma s plus 1 by k, again being multiplied by a factor of k, so we can just factor out k, we have some nice cancellation taking place, plus some constant of integration c. And using the properties of the logarithm, we can write this as i of s equals the logarithm of gamma s plus 2 by k divided by gamma, wait terribly sorry about that, s plus 1 by k plus a constant of integration c. And now we need to figure out exactly what this constant is. For that, let's recall exactly what the integral function was. Well, that was defined as i of s being the integral from 0 to 1 of x to the s minus 1 divided by 1 plus x plus or whatever, you get the point. And it was being multiplied by log x integration with respect to x. So if we plug in s equal to 0, we have 1 minus 1 in the numerator, so the entire thing would collapse to a big fat 0. So that's the initial value, we, uh, initial value condition for the sort of differential equation problem we're solving, applying Feynman's trick, basically amounts to just solving a differential equation given some initial conditions. So this implies, on plugging in s equal to 0, that we have 0 equal to the logarithm of gamma exactly what we have, s plus 2 by k. Oh, okay, fine. It's 
gamma 2 by k divided by gamma 1 by k plus a constant of integration c, which implies that c equals negative log gamma 2 by k divided by gamma 1 by k. And that means, again, using the properties of the logarithm, that i of s equals the logarithm of gamma s plus 2 by k divided by gamma s plus 1 by k times gamma 1 by k divided by gamma 2 by k. And there you have it. We have solved the integration problem, and we have this really exotic closed form in terms of the logarithm of this assortment of gamma functions to show for our effort. But there's still some ambiguity regarding the s parameter, the restrictions on the s parameter, because of this k parameter being thrown into the mix along with the gamma functions. We know for a fact that k is supposed to be a positive integer, and s is definitely not supposed to be negative 1 or even negative 2, because the gamma function has poles at, the gamma function has simple poles at all of the non-positive integers. Okay, cool. So we do have some idea of what s and what k would work out for our integral, but we have more important things to do right now. And what is that more important thing? Well, we have to figure out some cool results. And one very cool result I figured was for the case of s being 2 and k being 5. So let me rephrase this as i being a function of both s and k. Then the case of i at 2 and 5 is the logarithm of gamma 4 by 5 times gamma 1 by 5 divided by gamma 3 by 5 times gamma 2 by 5. Okay, cool. And now we can apply the reflection formula to a uh, formula to all of these cases. We know that gamma z times gamma 1 minus z equals pi times the cosecant of pi times z. So for the numerator, we have z being equal to 1 fifth, and for the, denom for the denominator, we have z being equal to 2 fifths. So this implies that i at 2 and 5 equals the logarithm of pi times the cosecant of pi by 5, correct? So we have pi by 5 here divided by pi times the cosecant of 2 pi by 5. The pi's cancel out quite nicely, and we're left with the logarithm of sine 2 pi by 5 divided by sine pi by 5, where I've used the fact that the cosecant is the multiplicative inverse of the sine function. Now using the double angle formula for the sine function, we know that sine 2 pi by 5 can be written as 2 sine pi by 5 and 2 cosine pi by 5. So we have we're left with log 2 cosine pi by 5. And cosine pi by 5 has a really neat result. This is actually half the golden ratio. So twice of that would be the golden ratio itself. So this, so this implies that the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared minus 1 divided by 1 plus x plus x squared plus x cubed plus x to the fourth power plus x to... Wait a minute. I remember writing the integral as k, yeah, it was up to k minus 1, right? Okay, this is cool. So we have this quartic polynomial in the denominator times the logarithm of x, dx equal to the logarithm of the golden ratio phi, which is pretty cool. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. Be sure to like and subscribe. Do drop me a follow on Instagram, and in case you like the channel and the effort I'm putting out, consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Thank you. See you next time.